What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Spark to Fire. I'm your host, Landon Rhodes. And today I've got my good friend, Joshua Kobayashi Johnston. How are you, my man? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me. You bet, bro. It's, I'm excited to talk to you today. So um, we just got done talking about your name and your your epic ping pong name. That's your Instagram that's right. handle. Okay. So uh, it, it's a, it's another agency story, um, but okay. essentially we played a lot of ping pong in the agency days. So we were we were all uh, in, 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 in <laughs> is Kobayashi like a world champion uh, ping yeah, pong that player? Is, that is my world. No, it's my my world champion ping pong name. So we all had <laughs> nicknames for each other. So do you know um, do you know Ashton's uh, head media buyer? Rob Perry? Uh, no, no, I don't, I haven't met okay. him. So, um, so I'm, I've met the people, all the people on the human side, but never okay. the head media buyer. Okay. Gotcha. So Rob, uh, Rob was our lead media buyer at Welling Media and now works for gotcha. Ashton. And he also has Stephanie, who is our, uh, lead account manager. Uh, so he's got a lot of the Welling team right now. Talent. Um, yeah, <laughs> he's super talented, but Rob, uh, in, in a lot of, uh, people like we would play ping pong, way too much in our agency uh and so we came up with like tournaments and during these tournaments we would like give each other nicknames and like we would have like a, a microphone and a speaker and like we would like announce <laughs> the games and so my ping pong name was joshi kobayashi uh, and awesome and rob's name was robbie kiyosaki and so like we just had all these nicknames for each other uh <laughs> for the ping pong and so it just kind of stuck with me and as i kind of like started to post more content and build a little bit more of a personal brand. I was like, Josh Johnston is one of the lamest white person names I could possibly think of. I was like, so I'm going to, I'm going to keep Kobayashi and I'm like, it's going to be Joshy Kobayashi. And I'm just going to lean fully into it. Uh, <laughs> and it's a great one. It's a great conversation starter. Cause like I'll it have is. people come up to me and be like, Kobayashi. <laughs> I'll be like, what's up? <laughs> it's so funny to me. That's dude. That's hilarious. Cause I oh, legit it, thought I was great. like, I don't, I don't want to offend him by saying the wrong name in the intro. And I legit pushed off the intro because I didn't know what your real name was. Yeah, that's too funny. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is Johnston. Uh, it is, Love I guess it. it's, my, it's my agency name, but you, yeah. can, you can call me Kobayashi. I don't care. Okay, awesome, dude. Well, let's get right into it. Basically, I just want to get into um, your experience at Welling and what it was like when you were, when you were in that business and sure. operating as COO. Uh, you are the opposite of me in a lot of ways. Probably I am, I, I think you're very much like you have potential or you are a CEO, CEO of your company and founder CEO of Hydra. But like, yeah. I wish I had more of what you had as a COO of an agency because just that operations aspect is so critical if you're ever going to scale an agency and you sure. have that. And I'm, I'm just honestly excited to hear how much you have that and, and the breadth and the depth of experience that you've gotten from working with Welling. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, yeah, well, uh, I appreciate the kind words. Um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I think being a COO has given me some perspective on what it means to scale. Um, and how I personally would like to scale as a business. Um, being in the agency space, we have a perception that scale is like the North Star goal of like, mm. we're going to scale this thing to seven figures, right? And it's like, that's always like the first goal, right? Everyone wants it to seven figure mark, which is super <laughs> exciting. And it's awesome when it happens, but um, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with scale, uh, like team for example. And this is something that uh, I didn't really figure out until we had a 25 person person staff. And I was like, dang, this is, this is kind of hard. This is a lot to manage. This is pretty stressful. Um, so just know like, you know, as you continue to scale your agency and anyone listening that's looking to scale their agency, it's like, there is a lot of responsibility that comes and there's a lot of stress that comes with scaling a team out like that. And for me, when I started Hydra, my biggest mental shift was how can we do this with the least amount of people with the best processes, the best automations, how can we delegate work appropriately uh, and make this thing a profit machine? Because at the end of the day, like Welling was profitable, right? Uh, and, and I think we did a pretty decent job for being so young in entrepreneurship and so young in the business world. Uh, because like back then, man, like we were like, we started an agency. So we started in 2018. I'll give you guys a little bit of the backstory that we have um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of knowledge kind of coming into this story. So um, we started in 2018. It was just myself and Chandler Welling, uh, the CEO uh, at the time. And he brought me in as, as the CEO. He's like, Hey, Josh, like 
I want to move you to Nashville. I was living in Michigan at the time. I want to move you to Nashville. We'll have you come in, step in as the chief operating officer. Uh, but he, he had said COO, right? And I was like, COO, that sounds great. I don't even know what that means, but I'm in. <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. Uh, and, and so it's so funny because as I came in, uh, it was truly not a position that I had earned uh, or even understood what it actually meant. Uh, and mm-hmm. so there was a huge learning curve uh, coming into that COO position. And I would say it wasn't until we sold the business and we ended up, uh, uh, I ended up leaving Welling Media that I just got this huge uh, uh, influx of just like uh, of knowledge of everything that we were doing wrong in the business. So it's actually really funny because it's like, you. I look back and I was like, man, like what a shit show. Uh, but <laughs> it, it was incredible because like we built a multi seven figure agency in two and a half years and, and got it to an exit, exitable position. And so with all that being said, um, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, I work with a lot of agencies, a lot of seven, uh, some eight figure agencies. And let me tell you, man, like, there is responsibility that comes with scale. And for me, like we're not trying to build the largest consultancy or the largest agencies. I want to build the most profitable agencies. Mm. I want to build businesses that you don't have to pull your hair out every day, worrying if your clients are going to pay you and that you're going to be able to make payroll. Um, and so for me, like that was the big perception shift. Cause I think uh, I'm 30 now and I don't know how old uh, you are Landon or 29. Uh, Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure you've kind of uh, seen enough of the agency space and uh, enough of business now where your mindset kind of shifts from, I want to scale so ridiculously fast into such a large point because you start to understand the responsibility that does come with it and and the stress that comes with it as well as you're starting to manage larger and larger teams. And not to say like, you know, and, and a part of that is like being able to develop teams and put good systems in place and good management teams in place in order to manage those people. So not everything is so reliant on you. Um, but it is, it, it is tough. And, and um, there is power in having a, a more of a boutique style agency that cranks 40 to 50% profit. And it's like, if you're looking for a specific lifestyle, an agency like that provides that. Uh, and you only have to be doing, you know, 40 to hundred K per month. And like you have a very healthy business, you can cash flow into so many opportunities. It's like the agency is the vessel, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It is not, it is not the end goal for most people, right? So true, dude. Wow. Say it again for the people in the back. That's exactly (laughs) what I thought when I got into it too. Yeah. A hundred percent. So you have to start treating the agency as a vessel for other opportunities, right? So uh, like a couple of things that I've seen in the space, like if you look at uh, the guys over at Boomin, for example, some of my favorite agency owners in the space, they run with like, and probably most of the people here probably don't know who these guys are. Um, uh, Colin McGuire and Ryan O'Connell uh, own an agency called Boomin. They work with maybe eight to 12, I don't know this for a fact, probably like eight to 12 uh, different brands, but they started to bring in their own brands and they do high retainer with these eight to 12 brands uh, mm-hmm. and they utilize that cash flow to help start their own internal e-com brands. And now they have like three or four internal e-com brands that they run. And what's great is that they can do the marketing and they can also do all of the fulfillment and all of the, uh, uh, you know, all of the creative all in house. Right. And so now this agency has become a vessel for uh, pretty much an e-com incubator. Right. And it's not just that it doesn't end there. Like, do like this goes into real estate. This goes into crypto. This goes into any, like whatever your, joys are uh in life it's like that's what it filters into and that's why i love the agency model but everyone's like scale 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 when really it's just like well what's the end goal like what are you really trying to do okay let's reverse engineer that and actually see how much money it takes and chances are a 60k per month agency with really good systems and operations lean and you can produce some good profit will provide that life that you're looking for it's true so true like we we went through we went through an evolution with this um several evolutions with this where first it was um started off with social media management um it was, you know and you're you're going to fall out of your you're going to fall out of your chair when you hear this high price I was charging for my retainers I won't we were, man but, we but at, shoot uh, 
we were at a uh, $200 a month for managing social media for a coffee shop. So we're talking basically rich, like, yeah, it's game I love over. it. No. <laughs> uh, we were, we were charged. I was charging that to get started. And um, you, then, then it became, Oh, can you do our website? Oh, can you do this? Or can you do that? And naturally you just say, yes, you say yep. yes, yes, yes to everything because yep. yes means money. No means no money. That's right. And how wrong how wrong that mentality actually is. And for anyone that's in this trap right now, it's important to not get into the yes in the yes trap oh. of being all things to all people. So uh, true. Dude, I, oh, the, the amount of anguish <laughs> that that probably caused in my life over the course of four years as I was learning yes. that lesson. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And now we just, uh, we just had an opportunity that we're, uh, that we're facing now and um, it, it came came to us and we're like, man, is this us? Do we want to do this? No. And yeah. it's, it's five figure. I mean, it's, it's a decent, it's a decent contract. Nah, it's not us. Sure. Next guy. Yeah. And, and when you, and when you truly get to that point to where you're turning down five and six figure, you know, relationships with customers, I think that's when you finally understood that, um, you know, that lesson. But yeah. how, how long did that take you to learn personally? Uh, you so, guys, I should say, at Welling. Yeah, so at Welling, we started uh, all over the place. So we were in e-com uh, in the automotive sector. Uh, we were also running social media management, which actually we kept um, throughout the entirety of our uh, of our business. Actually, it was extremely profitable, but we only took on brands that could pay us what we wanted. So we charged about 5K uh, mm -hmm. a month for the brands that we served. And we served about seven of them. Um, and we only had one social media manager um, that would manage all of those brands. And then they would get he, they would get some help from our creative side, of course. Right. But like that was the person scheduling all the posts and all that. So that was actually a very lucrative piece of our business every month. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we were all over the place when we first started. We were doing like drone footage for real estate agents. We were doing uh, <laughs> it, it, it was wild, man. Uh, I mean, we were taking pretty much everything uh, at that time. Uh, anything creative, anything outside of our niche. And then eventually we kind of kind of niched down even uh, into the e-com space and like more direct to consumer stuff. But uh, if you kind of like look back at the clients that we serve, you can really find our niche in like health and beauty space. Um, mm. You know, with a lot of the brands that we served, uh, a lot of like skincare type brands, uh, snow teeth whitening, um, care knee care care, like a lot of these brands that were, um, that were more beauty centric. And because we had a style uh, of content that we would shoot that spoke to that end consumer, right? A very mm -hmm. polished style of content. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, you know, a direct response marketing centric content. It was more brand centric. Brand centric. Content. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So we were very much that. And there were certain clients that we're looking for that direct response style that unfortunately one, uh, and I would, you know, unfortunately we just didn't have the talent uh, to understand that. We had very young crew, very talented on the production side of like conceptualization, getting behind the camera, doing the production, like excellent, but didn't have the direct response marketing chops that we should have had with some of the brands that we were serving. Now on more of the brand centric side, we crushed it. I mean, those were our best clients and those are the clients that we kept for, you know, upwards of 12 to 18 months uh, under contract. And, and for us, like those were the brands that we really should have niched down to um, and, and kind of played our game there versus going a little bit more broad, uh, even in the e-com space. And uh, another agency that does this extremely well is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the guys over at Lucid, uh, these guys are just some animals um but they only serve cbd e-com brands and i think it's such a smart play genius genius niche wow super, yeah super so genius niche um and <laughs> high profit yeah yeah exactly high profit and the the great thing about them is uh they almost have a monopoly on the space uh because they have a specialized rep at facebook that gets their ads approved wait and so what? they're one of the only brands only agencies that can post about CBD and hemp on Facebook and Instagram. That is outrageous. Yeah. And That's a can, stranglehold on the market. Exactly. Like, and they can speed right through the process. It's, it's, it's flawless. Uh, and so their execution is just, you know, 
10 out of 10, like no one can compete with them on that. Uh, but that is like the perfect example of niche positioning. And they, they hold about 33% of the D to C uh, hemp, hemp space, um, hemp and CBD. And they, they're multi, multi six figures per month. I would say, uh, I don't know. Once again, I don't know sort of fact. I've had a few conversations with their CEO and he spoke at my event, but um, I would say like roughly around that 300 K per month mark. Uh, currently, and uh, they're actually partnered with uh, with Nick Shackelford too. Uh, Shack bought part of uh, part of that business. So, wow, wow, so pretty, wow, wow. They're they're a cool brand, man. They've they've got great branding. They they're they're doing it big, and and eventually they're they're kind of like North Star goal. Um, is that uh, hallucin hallucinogens, hallucinogenetics, hallucinogen? Yeah, hallucinogenics. Yeah. I'm I'm so I I don't do any of that, and so I'm just like it's it's not a uh common term for me but uh like like mushrooms and in those things uh yeah. will soon be available to sell in certain states over facebook over facebook over facebook no way yeah so they are spearheading <laughs> that space as well uh and so they just they just have this part of the market corner. so how okay so let's back up because you probably asked this i'm sure you asked this because i i would have um, how, so how in the world did they get a Facebook rep to approve CBD products on Facebook ads? Yeah. So, um, so Aaron Nospish is, is the entrepreneur's name over there. Uh, that's the, the CEO. Um, okay. and he just, uh, he had some sort of connect with Facebook, uh, to get this representative and they, uh, and I think, so, uh, pretty much the story that he told me and, uh, when he speaks at events, I'm pretty sure he tells us the same story. Um, is that uh, he ended up writing like a letter to Facebook, um, <laughs> and I, it, like I said, I'm doing I'm not even doing this story anywhere near justice. But uh, it opened a doorway for him to get this representative, and now they have a very specif- uh, specialized representative that like just deals with CBD and hemp. Wow! Wow! So there must be. It's wild. They must have like special rules and this this tier or this arm of Facebook is watching over these more than ever. I'm well, sure it's that's like, the thing is, you know, I, and I, I don't know if you've ever worked with any of these types of brands before, but um, like if you went and, and tried to launch launch a new brand like this, it, it would get denied immediately. Um, like you wouldn't even probably wouldn't even be able to get it off the ground unless you had uh, a really good rep behind you pushing these things and that's where Aaron is just like you know that's why they have such a stranglehold over this this corner of the market is because no one else can get ads approved wow yeah dude I I can't even imagine like just comparing imagine like comparing like a um apple cider vinegar gummy brand like the best one yeah like ollie i think is ollie a a brand like that imagine like ollie competing with one of these brands and just a side-by-side product one has cbd one doesn't the just the money you would make first of all is insane so the profit is through the roof but also it is a blue ocean because so few people are actually advertising in that space yeah yeah uh yeah and it's it's always funny because like whenever they hit negotiations with, with some of their contracts. It's just like, what is there to negotiate on? It's like, where are you going to go? Like, can't go, like, there's no competitors that can do what we can do. <laughs> I just, that's just blows my mind. And yeah. I'm, I'm like, it's cool. Man. I'm like wondering if Facebook leadership even knows about this. I'm sure they do obviously, but I'm it sure just like <laughs> blows my mind that to think that this, that, that, that like give, that should give people hope that like always get their ads denied too of like, Hey, We are a very legitimate, um, you know, and I bet what ends up happening, and I'll get off this tangent in a second, but this just blew my mind. Um, What I imagine happens is there's a longer um, process and that their ads are probably manually reviewed or Mm -hmm. reviewed with special AI. Um, Fascinating. Very cool. So this is why I love talking to you because you just know very, very interesting people and you are also very interesting. So like I knew this, this conversation, I didn't have a ton of notes coming in here, but I knew this conversation would automatically be interesting oh, because hundred percent man. around yourself with if, cool people too. If we're talking about agency stuff, I can go for days. If it's anything else, I'm like, 
the awkward one in the room it's like whenever I go hang out with friends and stuff and it's like I don't know what to talk about like because I can't like sometimes it's hard just to talk about work the whole time uh, yeah. but if we're talking agency stuff I'm in man that's good that's good so tell me um so so you you build up you you and your co-founder you guys build up Welling Media and yeah. then you said you exited right yep so to walk us through that process what was it like um when you made the decision to exit from like that day until the day that you sold the company or you guys got acquired, what, yeah. um, what was that like that journey? Yeah, hundred percent. It was far from the perfect exit. Um, and, and, uh, you know, uh, Chandler would tell you the same thing. Um, it, we were early in the process. Uh, I wish we could have waited, um, maybe like one to two years extra, um, only because our prof, like our profitability could have been in a better spot. Uh, we could have gotten a few of our contracts, um, in a better position, uh, cause, uh, there's a few things that, you know, acquires will, will definitely look at when coming in to buy, uh, an agency like ours. Um, you know, of course, like the systems operational structure, EBITDA, like all those things are going to be really important, but one that we didn't really consider was length of contract. Uh, we mm. were really good and really scrappy on the sales side. Um, and, uh, that was something that Chandler really specialized in was landing sales and bringing, you know, new cash flow. And, but, you know, our initial signups were about 90 days. Uh, and this is something that I've really, really pushed pretty heavy on with our clients now. And, and um, you know, if you follow me on social media for any amount of time, you've probably seen a decent amount of posts around like churn, churn rate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we had a pretty, pretty rough churn rate. Um, like it wasn't, it wasn't astronomical by any means. Like we were still able to, to grow month over month, but uh, it our length of contract was the problem, right? So like we do like 90 days. And then after that, like we didn't really have um, much of an ascension into longer term contracts. And so uh, when you're, if you're trying to build to sell, um, taking into consideration length of contract uh, and try to get people into more long-term contracts, six to 12 month agreements. Uh, and this is, it was funny. We kind of had a Twitter battle uh, with a few people uh, uh, last week with like uh, Jordan Menard and like D Dang and like some of these big hitters in the, mm -hmm. the D to C e-com space. And, and we were just kind of jamming it, it. It was very, um, very amicable. Like we all came to, you know, good terms afterwards. Like they're, they're all friends of mine. Um, but uh, it was like, you know, Jordan had mentioned like, Hey, like we just do month to month with clients. And I'm like, if you ever hope to sell your business one day, you can't just do month to month with all of your clients, right? Uh, because that's one thing that they will take into consideration. It will get you a considerable higher valuation if you have 12 month contracts with clients. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. kind of like part of his pushback was like, well, like big brands or like, you know, big companies don't do long term contracts like that. And I was like, ours did. I mean, we had 30, 40K contracts in with people for 12 months. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're very doable. My partner, Nicholas, my current partner, Nicholas, uh, in Hydra, uh, I mean, he was working with Yahoo, Humana, uh, Northwestern Mutual, some really big, uh, some really big brands outside of the D2C space, but had six to 12 month contracts with those guys as well. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's very doable. It is not a, um, it, it's more of a, you know, perception game and mentality than anything of like why you should partner with brands long-term versus just being month to month. There's a commitment on both sides of the agency and the brand. So it is very doable. Um, you just have to be able to provide an excellent result, right? If you provide an excellent result, there shouldn't be any problem uh, signing a, a, a brand for a long-term commitment. And then the second part is, um, you know, being able to walk away from any deal. And that was something that we learned uh, pretty late on in our business was like, you know, we, we would negotiate pretty heavily. Um, but as soon as you kind of treat deals, uh, in a manner of like, I don't need this deal. Uh, that's when you, you gain a lot of leverage in the conversation because they still need a service. Right. And if you're the one that says, yeah, no worries. Like we understand that it's too expensive. We understand the terms are too long, but this is how we do business. Uh, and this is how we get the success for our clients. Uh, that's going to resonate with them and chances mm. are they're still going to sign that agreement. And so super long winded, but, um, that exit process, um, I would say a little bit early on our end, there was definitely some things that we could have done better. It was definitely more of a, um, the exit was definitely positioned more strategically, uh, from a standpoint of the VC firm that bought us had also bought a lot of e -com brands. So they had e -com brands underneath mm. their VC. Mm -hmm. And so 
kind of the route that we were taking was we're going to cycle these e-com brands through our marketing ecosystem. We're going to grow them with our marketing team, our content team, and then we're going to exit them in one to two years. Mm -hmm. So that was the concept, big picture idea. Seemed really attractive to us. And so we went ahead with it. Um, awesome. Which, which it was great. Like it, it was, you know, uh, at, at the end of the day, the exit didn't, didn't really work out uh, for pretty much everyone involved. Um, you know, uh, a year later, um, you know, uh, Welling and the VC ended up splitting. Um, I was gone uh, almost immediately after the exit. I was just kind of at that burnout point. Uh, mm -hmm. And so everything kind of just fizzled out and, and died, <laughs> unfortunately. But, uh, you know, lessons learned for sure. Um, but it was, you know, it was a great learning experience to actually go through an exit and be able to like go through a due diligence process and understand oh, yeah. what, like what VCs are looking for, what large agencies are looking for. And now, now we can help you know, other agencies not go through that same problem. And that's our, you know, if that is the North Star goal for our agency owners that we serve currently, then that's what we help them do, but in a more successful manner, because we understand what not, what not to do now. So, uh, and to this day under, our, uh, you know, in the two years that we've been doing this, we've, um, we have four agency exits under our belt now, which is pretty cool. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And so with Hydra? Yeah. So, uh, so my partner had one. Uh, so my partner sold his agency when he was 21 uh, years old. He's 25 now. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, our agency uh, that we sold at Welling, and then we've had two uh, of the agencies that have been through our Hydra ecosystem go through an exit. Very cool. That's a yeah. perfect segue to start talking about Hydra. So first of all, why the name Hydra? And your branding is dope. Is Did you Thank get you. the branding? Um, I saw like an image for like your mastermind. Was that like Hercules in Paris, like holding down the serpent? Is that what that's from? Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. I so so funny. I, I saw that image and I'm like, first of all, I love like mythology, Greek, all that I'm stuff. I played, played played Age of Empires, Age of Mythology oh, as a kid, so I'm obsessed yes. with all of that. Um, have been since literally like seven years old. So, um, I saw that branding. And I was like, that's, that's super cool. I, yes. I love that. It is so, very, um, derived from Greek mythology, uh, verse, yeah. um, verse Marvel. So it is not like, uh, the, the evil villain organization Hydra, which it's still funny because people will like, you know, drop comments and stuff. And like, they'll say like hashtag hail Hydra. I think it's just so funny. <laughs> uh, and so I just kind of roll with it. Um, so I don't know, we'll, we'll probably get some merch made at some point. That yeah, says, hey, you got, you're going to have to show up in red face paint one of these days, right? <laughs> Something exactly, exactly. Uh, but yes, very Greek mythology, uh, based. So all of our programs are Greek mythology based as well. So, uh, we have our Hydra program, which is like a one-on-one -on -one program. We have our Phoenix program, um, which is, uh, more like a group program. And so we're kind of like basing, like we're trying to like stick with a theme through the branding. Um, and so, yeah, that's essentially kind of like. Uh, how we develop this is I've, I've always been a huge Greek mythology uh, nerd and and have uh, just, I don't know, really always vibed with it. And like, we wanted something that was kind of head tilting of like, what is that? Like, what do you mean Hydra? What is this? Is this an, is this a, an evil uh, I immediately organization? That too. I yeah, immediately, you got is, me with that. <laughs> yeah. Is, is uh, like, what's going on here? And so for us, like, it was part of like, the curiosity of getting the click, right? Mm -hmm. And we knew that we would attract clicks by people saying, what do these guys do? And then when you go to our website and, and when you do a little research behind what we do, uh, it's pretty pretty clear in my opinion what we do. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, that was kind of the idea behind it. So before we were Hydra, we were actually uh, three, two, one pocket ops. Um, and so- yeah. Yeah. So, so essentially like the idea behind that was like, we're, we're kind of like operations in your pocket, but, um, it was like very like startup name and, and is, you know, first name. So, uh, we wanted to like lean into something that was like one name had a little bit of curiosity behind it, uh, yeah. and it would allow us to build a brand and then be able to stem things off of that brand. Bingo. Yeah, man. We, we went through that phase too. Uh, my first, my first one was R Mark Social. Okay. And it was my last name is Rhodes. So it was the letter R and then like a bar and then yeah. Mark Social. Yeah. Like leave your mark. And I was going to play, do lots of plays on words on that. Mm -hmm. So that was horrible. Um, 
I mean, it, it probably would have worked, you know, whatever. If, if, and then it was grindstone media LLC. And then it was just grindstone. It's funny yeah. how you go through that, uh, go through that evolution. And I yeah. remember, so I had a, um, a very, very successful agency owner that actually works with Adidas, Red Bull, Yeti. Um, he's wow. from my hometown. Um, in late, well, not my hometown, but where our office is based out of in Lincoln. And, uh, he's like, can I, can I just give you some advice? <laughs> like, yeah, dude, go for it. I'm going to listen to anything you tell me. Like you're, you're, you're a genius. And he's like, drop the media off the back of your name, because I just have a feeling you guys are going to start getting paid, um, to think instead of just paid to do media. I was like, smart man. Yeah. So I did that within like the next few months, drop that off. And we rebranded kind of refreshed our brand to less of like a gritty to more of like super clean. And that's exactly one of the best decisions we've ever made. So yep. yeah, that's, that's good. Completely agree, man. And, and, you know, one of our really good close friends, uh, is uh, he did all of our branding. And so, uh, we kind of told him what we wanted and we let him have the creativity and we made kind of like a mood board for him to go and like run with and Like we dropped all the Greek mythology stuff in there and, and yeah. it was like, it was so spot on for like what we were wanting. Uh, we were really excited with how it turned out. So, uh, and I, I love the color scheme, like just darker type color scheme, dark, dark deep purples um and like some accent oranges and stuff it's like it's, it's very on, it's clean on point. yeah if you guys haven't checked it out what's what's your website i love uh, your website yeah it's workwithhydra.com gotta gotta plug my website developer Nic nicholas reed he's also a client uh nicholas reed with 253 media if you guys are looking for extremely well done sites at relatively like good costs uh he's a good guy to check out so definitely okay if you're looking for new websites and stuff he does he does a lot on webflow uh and so the design aspect on webflow is insane it's so good uh so he does an excellent job so a uh, little selfless plug there for nicholas noted um is and so he's not he's not the same nicholas it's a partner right no, different. There's a different. lot of Nicholas's in my is there in my you life. Surround I feel yourself like. with those people. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my partner is Nicholas Kirshner. Uh, so he's the ex-president okay. of an agency called Margold Media, uh, and they worked with a lot of direct to consumer brands. Uh, actually, uh, his relationship is how we landed Snow Teeth Whitening. He he his team ran the paid media for Snow uh, from oh, like sick. from okay. like 2018 to 20 or yeah, like maybe like 2019 to 2020 uh, is when they ran paid media for Snow. Uh, so very early on in, in their growth. Uh, and then we ended up landing the creative contract um, through them. So we white labeled for a little bit and then eventually we took over the entire contract. That's so cool. Yeah, super cool, yeah, man. I love that. Um, for, well, yeah, I was actually about to bring up your website because I, I scrolled through it one day and I also showed it to my wife, Megan. I was like, this is like one of the coolest websites I've seen. <laughs> Thank I you, love man. it. So I, I, uh, I, I do, I, I probably will be giving him a call. If you could, you should, you should do it like an intro email. That'd be great. Yeah. Or a yeah. hundred percent, man. I got you. Cause we need some, we need some development on that end. And uh, yeah, dude, I, I love it because it's very dark, moody stands out. It's not just like white, clean corporate. It's totally different than, yep. than what you expect. So big fan of that. Um, So with, uh, so walk us through, what exactly does Hydra do? And um, let's start there and we'll probably branch off. Yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, it's so funny because uh, for a long time, I had a really hard, I like a really hard time conceptualizing what it was exactly we did. I knew it was important and I knew like the, op like the operational aspect because operational is such a broad term, right? People think often think operations and they think, oh, you're going to come systemize my business. Like we're going to build SOPs. Like that's what we're going to do, which don't get me wrong, like that is definitely part of what we do. And I love building systems and I love, I love, you know, processes and 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 all those things, mind mapping. Sure, let, let's get into the nitty-gritty of it. But um operations as a whole, and the best way that I can possibly explain this is that uh most agencies will be developed through five different lanes. Uh and those five lanes are lead gen, sales, fulfillment, finance, and HR. So those are your five five lanes of any agency. So if you break it down, it's like most agencies run through those five lanes, right? And so what we do is we help put better operational infrastructure in place. Once again, infrastructure, another broad term um, into those five lanes. So whether that is on the lead gen side, helping you drill down on the lead gen source, that's going to get you the best leads specifically for your agency uh, is something that we help people do. So that could be anything from 
putting together a better organic strategy for you to uh, helping you with a cold uh, a cold outreach um, type lead gen source. Maybe it's paid ads, right? So we help with all things lead gen. Uh, from their sales, so everything from organizing your pitch decks to the size of the types of clients that you're selling. So if you're going into a boardroom for the first time with a Fortune 500 company, that pitch is way different than pitching your D2C e-com brand mm -hmm. that you're pitching for 5 to 10K, right? Yeah. So two totally different pitches. And so we help prep people for their pitches. And if you're doing like just, you know, runoffs of like, hey, 5 to 10K pitches, great. Like, it can be more templatized, can be more systemized. But if you're going into a big pitch and you're pitching a 40K to 100K per month retainer, and those do exist, um, and we've done them before, then that pitch process is a lot different. You're going to present in front of a board and you're going to have probably the competition right outside the door from you pitching after you, or they're walking out as you're walking in, right? Mad and so style. madman style. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It is a very real thing. And so we prep people for their pitches in the sales process as well. Uh, after that fulfillment, uh, the one thing that we don't teach on fulfillment is like the actual like tactical fulfillment pieces of like, we don't teach people how to media buy, right? We don't teach people how to like make good converting creative. We our hope is, for that. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> our hope is that you come in with some base knowledge. And this is why we work with the clients that we work with. Most of our clients are north of 10 to 20K per month. Like mm -hmm. th that's our hope is like, you have some structure, you have, you have a skill set that you're able to sell to people, right? Mm -hmm. That's our hope, right? And so on the fulfillment, that's where the systems come in place and the SOPs. So when you bring in teammates, you can train them. They can have a system that they can fall underneath and they can replicate how you would do it for your clients. Mm -hmm. And good. then on the financial side, so a lot of like uh, just financial uh, modeling, like we're, we're not going to like uh, like do your bookkeeping for you or anything. Um, but the idea behind this is like understanding your numbers and collecting data. So as a COO, uh, this is like one of the, the biggest things that I learned coming out of the agency was I wasn't collecting enough data. Um, mm. Everything from, uh, everything from uh, data for our clients of like who's seeing the most success with our creatives to financial data of where's our money going expenses, you know, making sure that we're bringing enough to the bottom line, you know, building out a war chest, uh, you know, all of like the, the, the small financial things that we kind of push to the side because it's really not the most important piece. So, uh, we do a lot on the financial side and then, uh, uh, human resources. So we do, it's funny because we actually spend a decent amount of time on HR, um, because most of these most of these people don't have HR teams in place. And, and normally our recommendation is like HR is like very last thing that you would potentially bring on because we could put in good practices that'll keep you safe. Um, and so on the HR side, hiring is always really big for us. So like where to find talent um, and providing templates for, um, for applications and making sure that, mm. you know, you have good job postings out there. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, and it, like managing employees as well. So um, you know, making sure that there's review processes in place, making sure that there is, um, you know, if there needs to be a performance improvement plan put in place. Sweet. Like we have templates for all of that as well. It's like all of like the nitty gritty HR stuff we cover as well. So that is like the full scope of what we do. It's so broad with like everything that we cover, but it's niche specifically for agency owners. Mm -hmm. So everything that we build can be directly applied to an agency owner. We don't serve anyone outside of agencies, uh, which I absolutely love because now we can go a mile deep with the digital marketing agency world and be extremely good at, at building out a lot of these, these operational pieces for those That's businesses. Good. That's good, man. Do you guys, uh, this, this question just came to me and I was, I was curious on this. Does Hydra have its own pages to market itself or does it all run through you right now? So as far as like how we generate leads for ourselves? Yeah, generating leads for you, and um, I have other lead gen related questions, but um, yeah. I know you personally, like on your personal brand, you're doing a lot of content, and um, always always have stuff out there. So I was yeah. just curious, like, have you been running a lot of uh, Facebook ads for that as well? Um, yeah. What's been working for you? So our our um, our strategy for growth is much different um, than probably what a lot of agencies would would do. Uh, the consulting side is, in my opinion, is just slightly different. 
in, in how we model things. Um, so for us, we want a very low uh, cost, cost per acquisition as, as, <laughs> as any agency or, or brand or anyone would want a low uh, cost right. per acquisition cost. But um, for us, our, our goals, I guess, are not necessarily to scale. Like this kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation of like, we're not trying to scale extremely fast with this. Um, we're taking a very measured approach because co uh, coaching and consulting is a very, um, a very delicate market. Uh, if you burn a few people, you start to develop a pretty bad reputation. Uh, right. And I guess the same could be, could be said for, for the agency space, but um, you know, uh, for whatever reason, like coaching and consulting is one of those pieces that I'm like, I, this is a very fine line to, to walk. And, you know, you'll hear of a lot of nightmare stories coming out of people's coaching programs of like, they didn't help me at all. They didn't give me the time or attention that I needed. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that is the last thing that we want to build. So uh, we're taking a more organic approach to our growth. Um, we rely pretty heavily right now on uh, organic channels and uh, referrals um, for our lead generation. We have a Love great it. we have a great LTV with our clients. Most of our clients stay on for twelve to eighteen months. Uh, some have have been with us since we've started uh, the business. Now, of course, we have churn, just like any service based business does. But mm -hmm. um, you know that is our play is that we're cultivating community and building building something that people want to be a part of uh and what's great is like we have entry points for our community that's affordable for anybody uh yeah well not okay not anybody but agencies that i would say are doing 10k plus per month there's yeah. there's there's places for them to enter right totally and so for us it's it's less of a play of like we're trying to generate you know really high ticket uh uh type sales um we're trying to build uh, a strong community of agency owners that can support each other right and so when it comes to the customer acquisition side uh twitter is massive for us we absolutely crush it on twitter really it's what twitter it's wild. yeah it's wild because i have 1100 followers and my partner has 800 um but we do uh we do a lot of two-step uh resources in twitter and these things blow up like wildfire. It's insane. Really? So um, our agency impact planner, which you can download for free if you click on the link in my bio. Uh, it's this one right here. Uh, if you have downloaded any type of planner in the past, uh, you'll know that this is a very um, uh, a very common resource. Uh, Traffic and Funnels has one, uh, Productivity Planner, uh, something along those lines. Um, but uh, we designed a planner that was specific for agency owners. And so uh, essentially the premise of the tweet that, that we posted for this planner was, hey, we've worked with 50 plus agency owners over the past 12 months. Uh, the one thing that they had in common is that they struggle with uh, 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 productivity and time management. So we designed a planner specifically for agency owners that's going to give you time back into your day and make you feel more organized. If you comment and if you retweet, We'll send you the planner and DM it to you for free. And we have an autoresponder set up through uh, uh, an application called Hype Fury, uh, not affiliated. Yeah, it's a dope, uh, it's a yeah. dope uh, app. I've used it before. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. And so it'll send an auto DM with the link to this. Now we exchange an email for the download, right? So we get mm -hmm. a name, agency name, and an email. And now we have someone on our email list, right? Yep. And so uh, that one tweet alone collected 400 emails for us. Shut up, dude. 400 yeah, 400 emails i love the built-in growth of like you have to retweet it to uh to get that back that's, that's right man yeah smart, so man. so uh you know and not every resource hits like that but we we release probably two resources a month um that have a pretty strong like call to action like that where it's like hey retweet comment and we'll send it uh because it has such a good reach um and we make them very specified for our niche so if it does hit we get a lot of attention with our specific niche. Uh, so, and this is the same strategy that we're, we'll utilize with a lot of our agencies as well is, hey, like start developing resources for brands that actually help them and give them value. This isn't mm -hmm. just a ploy to like collect emails. Like our, our main goal for these resources is that you grow your business. Because if you use our stuff and you grow your business, one, we get better positioning. So our market leader positioning is excelled exponentially because the thing that we gave you for free works and <laughs> what's, then what's the paid one gonna do right yeah what's the paid one gonna do exactly right. so um 
so that's kind of like the strategy and we're very macro focused on that of like we're playing a three to five year game i'm not playing a six month game right i don't care that's like, good we're, like we're we're profitable enough to to pay for our bills for for you know months on end right so it's like we have everything that we need we can just play a longer game than most people can right and we're consistent with it too uh one of our one of our internal mantras is that we do the boring work um and i've seen that yeah yeah we love it uh it's one of our favorite ones and it's like that's what we're willing to do like we're willing to like kind of beat our head on the desks until until it works because like we trust in that process but uh that's like one of the lead gen models that we're utilizing right now uh we're testing more and more cold outreach strategies uh we're trying to crack something that is less uh, a little less um, transactional and more relational, right? So uh, that's something that we've been working on for uh, roughly 30 days now. Um, so we're, we've been working on that. We think there's an opportunity there, but we're trying to pull back from just going straight for a transactional cold DM and making it more relational. Um, I don't know how it's going so far. I'm not I'm not heading that incent, uh, initiative up quite yet, um, but it seems to be something that we're we're leaning into. Uh, paid ads, uh, awesome opportunity for you to land clients. Uh, but it's like, well, what can you spend? Uh, and do you understand what it takes to actually acquire a customer? And for most people, it's like you might have a six to eight hundred dollar customer acquisition cost. And uh, people just have a very hard time spending ten k a month on ads to get you know get those clients right. And so it, it also depends what niche you're in as well. Uh, our lead gen guys kill it on paid ads. Uh, so like, um, if you're doing like, uh, like real estate, um, like lead generation for like sellers, home sellers or buyers, uh, if you're doing, uh, stuff in the contracting space of like landscapers, mm. stuff like that, like home services, home services, right. Exactly. Um, those guys crush it on paid ads because I think that marketplace is a little less jaded. Uh, whereas in like, mm. uh, paid ads and e-com i just i just have a hard time with it um especially if you're running like a paid ads agency if you're doing creative a little little more traction there um but paid ads it's really tough man i mean you're going to bat against some big dogs in the space with some paid ad strategy um mm -hmm. so for me i'm a big fan of playing the long-term game especially if you're in e-com because I'm, i mean you know they're going up against you they're going up against nick shackleford ashton shanks um you know these big dogs in the space that are they they move some numbers and they've got good results, man. They're not bad at what they do. Um, right. And it's like, if that's your competition, you have to kind of take a look at how in reverse engineer, how they put themselves in this position. And if you watch a lot of them, Nick Shackelford, Ashton, these guys don't run paid ads for their actual agency service, right? Human X is a, is a different story with Ashton, but for their paid ad service of like them actually working with brands, straight reputation play. 100 percent do great work and you'll cash in on that but it's like that's that's the benefit of of kind of like working with us is you know we get to see so many agencies and their tactics and the inside of a lot of agencies and stuff that works stuff that doesn't work and uh you know you know that's the difference is like it depends what kind of agency you're running is the type of tactics that we'll normally deploy i think everyone should have an organic strategy everyone should be building communities uh of people that they serve um mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of uh, I don't know if you know Lo Silva at all, but he has their yeah. their their C four method or whatever, and, and part of that C four method is is community, build community, and I think that's so often overlooked because it's hard, and and it's not that it's hard, it takes time, it takes and time. and most people aren't willing to give it two to three years to build their name in the space. It's true, it's very true because it does it does take that time, and and you can if you've got cash, you can probably accelerate it a little bit with events. Sure. Um, on the community side, like you guys, I, I, you know, me seeing you guys do more events with Hydra, uh, gave me an opportunity to understand more of what you do because I've been seeing like, okay, they got an event here. They got an event there. And I, I looked more into it because you were having events. Yep. And 100%. I think that's, I think that's a very wise thing as well. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, for us, like, and that's the, that's the power of profit. Right. And this is yeah. where I'm like, sometimes it's good to not hit so hard on the scale season and reinvest everything back into the business because it allows you to do things like this. And so for us, like we didn't have, like we weren't profitable on this event, like our first event. Um, we ended up losing, I think like two grand on the event, which is really like 
in the grand scheme of like people hosting events, that's probably pretty good. Um, yeah. Uh, especially for our first one, uh, we didn't get a- any sponsors. Uh, I was talking with Nick Shackelford and he was like, you guys didn't get sponsors. I was like, no, he goes, always get your sponsors first <laughs> and then, and then schedule your speakers and schedule your, your event space and all of that. He's like, but like your sponsors cover your hard costs of the event. Uh, and then ticket sales are your profit margin. Wow. Did not know that. That is, yeah. that is helpful. Never put on an event like that. So that's, yeah. that's very helpful. Same. So we were just, we were just kind of gunslinging uh, and like we went hand to hand combat for most of our ticket sales and like just reaching out to people and seeing uh, you got one of those DMS to see if people wanted, wanted to go. Right. And so, yeah. um, you know, but like we were able to do that because we had cash. Right. And mm-hmm. because we had been so profitable. And so we paid for the entire event uh, before we really even sold the ticket. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for us, like, that's the power of building a brand. And for us, like we know it's a, it is a brand play. We're not trying to be profitable on our events. We're trying to get more attention. We're trying to build brand presence. We're trying to be a leader in this space. Yeah. And that's the power of also like going on people's podcasts. Like everyone wants to skip straight to the big stage. Right. And it's like, I want to go speak at events. I don't know how many times I've, I've heard that from agency owners. It's like, great. What podcast have you been on recently? <laughs> how, how have you been sharpening right. this? How have you been sharpening this craft of speaking in front of people? It's like, cause this is step one right here. If you can come and speak on a podcast and, and deliver a good message here, then you're going to be able to go and speak on a stage and you're going to have that credibility because if you want to speak on a big stage, people are going to ask you for you speaking on stage. Right. And it's like, <laughs> that's what they'll ask for. It's like, Hey, your resume is you speaking. And so you'll need to have some recorded podcasts. You'll need to have some maybe smaller events that you can go and speak at, right? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of build up from here. And then the last part of the lead gen, and this will kind of bring it uh, uh, back to the top, is events. Uh, We we have a budget um, of about 100K uh, a year to go and spend on education and events. And events is one of the best places that we've found one, to, to get connected with the right people and to land uh, speaking slots at on stages, um, but also uh, the ability to land clients as well um, at events. And so hmm. for us, like you have to, like, if you want to be associated with some of the bigger names in the room, it's like, yeah, you have to, you have to go to their events. You have to buy tickets and, and you have to buy them sometimes for full price. And like, well, I got pretty fortunate when I first started, like I hit up Nick Shackelford and he was like, dude, like, come, come to, uh, come to Austin. Uh, that was the first geek out that I went to. He's like, come to Austin, man. He's like, tickets on me. He's like, just get your flight and your stay out here. And, you know, you can come attend for free and we can jam on some op stuff. And, you know, that'll be like our trade-off is like, you help me with some op stuff and I'll get you a ticket. And I was like, That's awesome. I was like, yeah, like totally in for that. Right. And so, you know, those opportunities might happen, but if they don't, you need to have a budget for, for getting connected with the right people. If you're just playing in your own little corner and like trying to do it by yourself, um, it's tough, man. Like if, if people don't know you in the space, it's hard to have that market leader positioning. Um, yeah. And so, and, and you look at people like Ashton, you look at people like Shaq, these guys have their positioning down. And it's like, people know them. Like, like what Ashton's nickname is the most savage media buyer. Right? It's like, come on now. Yep. Like, yeah. That that is what they're known for. So right. at the end of the day, if you're not doing those things, I think you're gonna have a hard time with lead generation. And if you're not playing a macro game, you're gonna have a hard time with lead generation. You have to be really that's good. It. That's super good. And I love what you said about um Ashton and their team as far as like uh lead generation. Cause I asked him that. I was like, how do you generate leads for your business? He's like, people call us. Like that's it. He's like, people exactly. hear about what we did for 10 other brands and they're like, uh, sign me up. Yeah. I mean, there's it's no the, ads, there's no funnel. It was like pure reputation. Yeah. And you know, what's great about that too, is now your price point starts to elevate, right? Because now there's no negotiation of like, okay, cool. Like you want to work with us. That's awesome. It costs 15 K it costs 20 K mm-hmm. to get, to get working with us. So if like, this is the type of results that you want, this is what you can expect to pay. That's right. That's right. What have you seen? Uh, so you, you said you work with some creative like video production agencies as well. Yeah, we do. What have you seen um, those creative agencies as far as lead generation goes for them? They're a very demonstrative, uh, you know, industry. So yeah, showing yeah. what they do. 
hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, that's what I love about creative is like, there's a sexy aspect to it, right? Like it is, mm. it's visual. Uh, and so, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's a little bit easier to market. So, uh, like, uh, one of the greatest examples of this is Suna, uh, Suna is more of like, a, uh, um, kind of like subscription or not subscription based, but it's more like, um, you build your package, uh, mm-hmm. uh, really cool, really cool agency. Um, and they're doing some really cool work, but, uh, yeah, like a paid ad strategy, in my opinion, works well with, with creative. Um, you just have to have, you know, the right sizzle reel and, and the right, um, the right positioning and being able to flex your results, uh, you know, through a, through a solid ad campaign. Um, but as far as like other lead gen, uh, for that, uh, partnerships, man, uh, if you're running a creative agency, man, get like, get to a geek out event because these geek out events, they're all paid, paid dudes. Uh, it's like, mm, they're all and they paid. Need creative. They need creative. Everyone needs creative. And there's not a lot of really good creative agencies out there. There's, there's some, but, um, you know, you need a good creative agency to support your paid media team. Um, so if I were a creative agency today, that's what I would be doing. Um, investing probably into events first, uh, and getting connected with agencies that don't have a creative department, white label underneath them, uh, and, you know, stick true to your pricing and then just have, have them upcharge their clients. Exactly. Yep. That's, that's a hundred percent. Like I've, I've been, uh, been coaching one of my students as well. And that's, that's definitely our play He's in the outdoor market. And, yep. um, I'm like, dude, you, you, there's so many agencies that are already working, you know, working alongside, uh, exactly. these huge brands. You don't have to get Yeti as a client, you get Yeti's PPC or not PPC, uh, Yeti's Instagram agency who's running their Instagram ads or their Facebook yep. ads. Exactly. You know, get, exactly. Get them. And, yep. uh, you'll be one of many contractors under their, under their belt. But at the same time, you, you know, you're getting an opportunity to work with Yeti. hundred you know? percent. It's, it's great for your portfolio. And if, if you can sneak past the NDAs and, and, and all of that, like it gives you a really good positioning, um, and, uh, allows you to hopefully go and land some bigger deals down the road. So, um, but yeah, man, creative agencies in super need right now. Um, there's not a lot of, a lot of creative agencies out there. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity in creative right now, especially the UGC space. Um, there's some really cool, uh, opportunities in that space as well. So what do you mean by that? UGC uh, user generated content or yeah. So more of like the influencer, uh, style UGC. So being able to ship a product out to an influencer of some sort, and then putting together a UGC type ad, uh, and, and we'll see how long it lasts for. We've seen some restrictions, um, with influencer content um, in some countries, uh, I can't remember which ones exactly, but I remember reading an article about it, um, that they're limiting influencer, uh, ads on, uh, like on organic, um, mm. socials. Right. So, uh, they're not able to post, uh, certain things and they're not able to actually run influencer campaigns. Uh, interesting. Because, like, yeah. It's very interesting because, um, essentially, uh, it's like the influencer has never really used the product. And it's like, they're just doing it for a paid promotion. They're not doing it because it is uh, the product works or uh, because it's something that they actually use. So uh, some some countries, it hasn't been uh, too many, but you started to see some regulation happening there. Um, so just something to be aware of. Love it. Well, that's, that's helpful. Um, that's very helpful to know just as people are considering getting into that space. Mm-hmm. I have a, a couple other follow-up questions before we wrap up here. And sure. Um, so I was curious, what books have you been reading lately that you've been referring to friends that they're that good? Yeah. Um, let me look at my my shelf here right now. <laughs> it it really depends, um, I guess, on what they're asking about. Um uh, I'm a uh a, a big book nut. Um, so I guess if I had like if they were asking something specifically, um of like, hey, like, what should I read for this type of scenario? Let's or like, say ops because you're the ops guy. Yeah, so Systemology is a relatively new book that released probably I heard that one yet. Uh, a year or two ago. Uh, it's by okay. uh, uh, Steve Jennings, Greg, Steve, Steve Jennings, uh, Australian dude, uh, but it's called Systemology. Um, it is like the handbook of creating systems for service-based businesses. Excellent wow. book. Like I, this is my 
it's kind of like my Bible when it comes to creating systems, uh, scaling up, uh, Vern Harnish mm-hmm. also has some really good methodologies in there. Um, uh, I do like traction. Um, it's not my favorite. Um, I like scaling up slightly better than I like traction. Um, but like those three books are pretty good on like the system side of things, uh, especially with like high level operational structure of like, you know, uh, like yearly and quarterly planning. Uh, I think that's yeah. super, super undervalued in the agency space. A lot of times we just, we're firing from the hip day to day, get your, like get your yearly plan, shrink it into your quarterly plans and then get it into a monthly plan and then work in 30 day sprints. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, as much as we love to preach the macro view of like being patient with our agency, we have to take the micro actions to actually get there. And so for us, like we have all of our agencies work in 30 day sprints of like, here's our biggest impact items over the next 30 days. Here's what we're going to drill down on. And those books are what taught us that. And then we just uh, created new uh, intellectual property around what we pulled from those books and then put it into our own program. Uh, so. Awesome. That's really good. I, those are, so Vern Harnish, um, I, I'm familiar with that in Rockefeller habits, yep. the Rockefeller habits checklist is one of the greatest things. Oh, it's great. Um, that, that long list of like business health and love, love, love that. It's just like a great way to walk into any business and be like, yeah. how are you doing on any of these? Yep. hundred percent. Uh, that's, and it's across all businesses, but that systemology book, I just bought, um, just bought that. So I'll oh, that it's, in. it's excellent, man. Uh, if you're, if you're really struggling with the system side of the business and you're like, I don't know how to like, when I don't know how to build systems or SOPs, uh, I don't know what it looks like from a high level or how to even document and store my systems or where to store them at. This is like the playbook. So it's really, so, it's really good, really applicable. Love that. Uh, and then anything by Mike Michalowicz. Mike Michalowicz is by far my favorite author um, when it comes to like like simple business building. I think we tend to complicate business a little bit too much. Uh, Mike Michalowicz does an incredible job of bringing it back down to earth and just making things really simple. So uh, you got profit first, clockwork, pumpkin plan. Um, Trying to think of some of his other ones. Those are like... Fix, oh, fix this, then that. Yeah, f- yeah fix this, then that. Um, so yeah, he's he's got some great ones and uh, a great audio book um, to listen to as well. He's a very um, energetic author, uh, and he he's he narrates his own audio books and they're excellent. He's super funny, uh, very in, uh, engaging in his audio books. And then uh, anything on the like leadership side, uh, this is something that I feel like everyone needs to continue to sharpen is the leadership uh, side of their um, their development. Uh, Patrick Lencioni is. Mm such an incredible author when it comes to leadership. And then of course you have, you know, like the John, John Maxwell's John Gordon um, side of the world as well. It's a little bit dry, uh, but also really good, um, really good books. So. Yeah, dude, I just, uh, I just picked up that I, you're, you're reminding me. And I, so I, every time I look at, at buying a book um, I'll put it in my cart Yep, and then I will keep adding it to my cart. And when it gets to three, I'll usually buy it because okay. it's just like the third time I'm hearing it. It must be, must be good. And so you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned profit first and simple numbers, straight talk, or sorry, not that, not that one profit first. And then you mentioned um, the Patrick Lencioni one. And that was like the third or fourth time I'd heard. Yeah. That. I was like, okay. Got profit. It. I, I attribute profit first um, to us as a consultancy, never having um, a month in the red. Uh, so we've always, we've always operated profitably Hmm. because of this book and how we operate our finances. Um, it is, it's so crazy because it's such a simple concept and it's so easy to apply, Hmm. but we just don't do it. Uh, and it's, it's an excellent book. I won't ruin it for anyone that wants to read it, but it's, um, it honestly, a life changer for me, because like I said, we've been able to build an, uh, incredible war chest, um, in our first couple of years of business and like the stress of money just isn't there. Like I don't have to worry about making payroll. I don't have to worry about paying myself uh, or paying expenses. It's like, it's all taken care of because it, it literally sits on my desk because it's like my favorite book. So it's, it's, always, <laughs> it's, always, it's always here. <laughs> That's great, man. Awesome. Well, uh, dude, I, do you have anything else that you uh, wish I would have asked you? Anything you want to share? Parting, parting pieces of advice, anything like that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, parting pieces of advice, I always try to leave on, you know, uh, uh, I feel like this whole conversation has been really positive, but um, yeah, just, you know, uh, continue to play the macro game for anyone kind of listening to this. Don't feel like you 
uh, don't feel like you need to compare yourself to other people in the space. Um, you know, a lot of these guys that you see are super successful. Um, I get to see a lot of these, these agencies and the grass is always greener. Uh, you know, when you're looking in, it's like, we all have the same problems. Um, so at the end of the day, don't, don't feel like you're like behind or doing something wrong. And like someone is, you know, exponentially further than you. It's just, trust me, it's like, there's, there's levels to the stress that everyone kind of deals with. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with a lot of successful people and they've got their problems too. Uh, and sometimes social media and, and stuff like that doesn't show it, but, uh, we, sure. we all got our stressors. Um, so just keep building your thing. And sometimes you got to put the blinders on and, uh, you might get through. That's good. It's good. Wise words from the man. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, thank you yeah, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Dude. I appreciate I, you having I, me, man. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And I think this is the the first of many conversations. So um, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Spark to Fire. I hope you enjoyed this show and uh, make sure you check out Josh. What What is your, what is your IG where people yeah. can find you? Yeah, it's Joshy Kobayashi. So it's J-O-S-H-Y. K O B Y A S H I. There you go. Got it. Love it. So, yeah, man, you guys got to check him out. He's putting out some great content, um, great organic always throughout the week. I love watching his stories and seeing what he's up to with Hydra. So, highly recommend checking him out, guys. And then workwithhydra.com is their website. If you want to look at a dope website, get some ideas. I, I got some ideas for sure out of that. And, uh, Thank you for listening to the show, guys. Please leave a rating, a five-star rating and a review. The written reviews are how people really get to know and trust this, this brand of Spark to Fire. And it's how we get more great people on the show, guys. So appreciate all of you guys who have left a review and who is sharing this, uh, this podcast and look forward to seeing more positive reviews on the way. So have a good day and keep striking. 